My name is Claude Warren, uh, and I'm here to talk about the impact of cultural relativism on building cross-cultural intersource communities. So let me introduce myself first off. Um, I am a cross-cultural intersource and open source uh, team member, and I've been a leader of such teams. Uh, I list myself as a technical effectuator. And if you look for me on uh, you know, do a Google search or something like that for me, I am not the one that's in Wikipedia. That is my father. And if you look at that, at his entry, you will find a link to my mother. And if you look at both of them, you will see that they were students at Northwestern University, where they became immersed in the theory and practice of cultural relativism. Uh, they were students of uh, Melville Herskovitz, who himself was a student of Franz Boas, whom we will get to in a moment. But suffice it to say that both of my parents were cultural relativists, and that I grew up in a framework of cultural relativism. You'll also find on this slide uh, links to my social media sites. So, but let us start by defining culture. Culture is learned behavior. So it's, it's your learned social framework. It's what you learn as a child. It's what you learn at work. Um, but as an example, let's look at, it's not that you eat, but what you eat that is part of your culture. So here we have um, two images, the one on the left, is a durian fruit that comes from Southeast Asia. I point out that there are signs in the Singapore mass transit terminals that prohibit you from bringing this fruit into the station or onto the vehicles. Uh, it is said to be an acquired taste. I've tried it. I couldn't acquire the taste. To me, someone from a Western culture, it smells like rotting flesh. The second picture obviously is a picture of a cow. And for those of us from the West, uh, we look at that and we say, ah, beef, milk, cheese, things like that. But if you're Hindu, that cow was a sacred animal, and those thoughts probably wouldn't cross your mind. So let's look at a culturally determined perception. So it's not that you perceive time, but how you perceive it. Now, the Amara people in the Andes perceive the past for several generations as lying in front of them. After about seven generations or so, the past goes left to right. So for the Amara, face, uh, so the Amara face the past and not the future. Uh, and to us, Back to the Future is an interesting play on words and a great movie title. But for the Amara, it's the normal way to perceive time. The Amara don't go forward to the future, and anyone cajoling them to do so would sound just as silly as someone telling us to go backwards to the future. So now that we have a brief understanding of, of culture, let's look at cultural relativism. And cultural relativism is the idea that beliefs and practices can only be understood from within the culture uh, that, that creates them. Uh, and its first recorded concept, or recording, first recording of this concept was um, by Herodotus, who was a Greek historian from 484 to 425 BCE. He was writing about Darius the Great, who was a Persian ruler from 522 to 486 BCE, so way back in time. And Darius inquired about funerary customs on the eastern and western fringes of his empire. In the east, the funerary uh, custom is cannibalism, and in the West, it was cremation. So Herodotus wrote that when each of those populations was told of the other's custom, they were dismayed and they abhorred the other's practice. Now, cultural relativism was established as axiomatic in anthropology by Franz Boas in the early 20th century. Franz Boas was a professor of anthropology at Columbia University from 1899. Uh, he's called the father of American anthropology, and he first articulated the concept in 1887, but he didn't coin the term. That fell to Alan Locke, and Alan was reviewing Robert Lowy's Culture and Ethnology book. Um, Alan Locke is an American writer, uh, philosopher. He was the first African-American Rhodes Scholar. Uh, Robert Lowy was a student of Franz Boas, uh, and, and Lowy emphasized cultural relativism as opposed to cultural evolution, evolutionism, which was popular in the Victorian era. Uh, and Alan Locke in this review basically talked about 
Robert Lowe's extreme cultural relativism. And at this point, we had, this is the first occurrence of the phrase uh, imprint. So why do we care? We care because the tools developed by anthropologists and ethnographers will allow us to find the friction points between cultures in our cross-cultural teams. And the friction points lead to misunderstandings. Misunderstandings can lead to cohesive breakdown in the team where members begin to think other members are working against them or sabotaging their efforts. Uh, it can cause misunderstanding of work assignments. So you, the wrong things end up being developed. And all of that can lead to the failure to deliver the correct work product. So let's look at a couple of examples of cultural relativism in action. Now I had originally intended to put a slide here with only the swastika that's in the lower left hand corner uh, and followed by this slide. And my intention was <clears throat> the shock peach people from Western cultures while I spoke about how it was a symbol of evil and hateful things and how it's banned in some countries and how I had seen it used as avatars on email lists and how that use almost always resulted in a row over anti-Semitism, hatred, and the meaning of symbols. And then while showing this slide, I was going to talk about how it is a symbol of, for divinity spiritual, and spirituality in uh, Hinduism, Buddhism, and Jainism. It also appears in ancient Greek and native North American art. However, after presenting a rehearsal of this talk, I came to believe that such use might be a career limiting move. So instead, I present my self censoring as an effect of cultural relativism in action. My cultural mores would not allow me to display the swastika by itself. As a second example, and talk about color. And with the exception of people with color vision deficiencies, everybody perceives color the same way. Uh, the light enters the eye, it hits the cone in the back of the eye, nerves fire, brain gets a signal, color is perceived. However, some languages, for example, have no, no word for the color green. So instead of using, uh, instead they use the term for yellow or blue. So cultures with those languages the stoplight may only have two colors and the phrase go on green makes no sense. I would note that in Irish, the color of a person is their hair color, not their skin color. And in Irish, the term for a person of color or a person with darker skin is blue. So the translation of black lives matter and blue lives matter are the same so the distinction that is so strong in US culture is lost in translation. So in summary, judgments are based on experience and experiences interpreted by each individual in terms of his own culture. So let's look at a few examples of cross-cultural uh, relativism in the cross-cultural teams. So the first example I have is um, the project is transitioning development from one culture, one team to another. And the culture of the receiving team, it's not permissible to show failure. That's perceived as a career limiting move. In the culture of the receiving team, it's also not acceptable to disagree with someone who's perceived to be of a higher rank or status. Now, the major issue here is the team, this new team did not wanna do any work in public, which makes open source, inner source development extremely difficult. Uh, and so we had to find a way to, to bridge this gap. And so to do that, we made it, first we made it uh, safe to fail. And we uh, basically showed that there were failures from the original team. We had, we showed, you know, code that didn't compile and false starts, all of that is, is and showed that it was available and, and you could see all of that and that that wasn't something that anybody was penalized for. Uh, we pointed out that nobody's going to look at failed jobs in the build system unless you ask. We pointed out that you know, developers were not allowed to change the main branch of code. So um, if they were able to do this somehow by accident, that was a defect in controls and anybody who was able to do that should be credited with discovering a bug. 
uh, we made sure that all developers followed the same process and that this was modeled. Everybody, you know, you could see that nobody was doing anything that wasn't defined in the process. And we also made sure that, you know, no code could be reviewed or discussed unless it was in the version control system. And this gave us the added benefit that uh, for, besides everybody being able to see it, you would be able to see the same code at the same time, make sure you're talking about the same piece of code. And on top of that, because uh, if there was a failure of a laptop or a desktop, we would have all the code, obvious benefits. But we also made it safe to disagree. Uh, and we did this by modifying the daily standups, which were our typical um, agile standup. And in this case, we extended that and we introduced discussion and allowed for dissent uh, and it, within that discussion. And we wanted to encourage that. Uh, to get that feedback coming so that um, this team would come in and bring their new perspective and we, we would all get to learn from that. Um, the net result here is that we established the project culture uh, and it was not, you know, our culture, my culture is right and your culture is wrong, but the culture of this project is. And then, uh, okay, so, so as a second example, uh, in this case, all the members of this are, are from Western cultures or all from Europe or, or North America. Um, this conversation occurred on Slack and basically there's a conference coming up and I asked the question, you know, where can I go to see the, the schedule for this conference? And I was told it's online at this location. Go look. I went to look. You had to be registered to see that. I came back. I said, I can't see it. I'm not registered. And the question was, if you're not registered, why do you care? And a, Co a co-worker of mine said, that was rather rude. And I looked at that and I said, okay, yeah, I, I can see that. But for me, I didn't perceive it as rude because I had worked with these people for so long that I had been indoctrinated into the culture. I'd been enculturated. And I knew the, the stress of running a, cult of a conference and the stress that they were under at this point, just before the conference started. And so that short answer was you know, question was, was reasonable to me and that it would just take too long to say, I don't see why anyone who's not attending would be interested in start and end times. Can you elaborate on why you want to know? The person answering, asking the question was trying to get through all the things they had to do that day, short and sweet, sweet get it off the plate, be done with it, no problem. But what this shows is that culture determines how you respond to written comments. Uh, particularly because there are no vocal or facial cues, cues, and I would note that those are culturally based anyway. So uh, you have to be careful when you, even when you have those in a cross-cultural setting. But let's look at how we can succeed. So first, define the culture of the project, uh, not just in words, but in actions. If you want to have inclusivity and you want to do ins inclusivity training, that's great. The training will tell you what to do but practice is the execution of the training and practice is what builds the culture. If you want to do sensitivity, same sort of thing, you can do the training, but it's the practice of the sensitivity that builds the culture. Make it safe to disagree. Um, disagreements can surface cultural differences, which can then be addressed before they become a problem. And finally, make it, or make it safe to psychologically to fail. Um, failure can be a result of misunderstanding that didn't rise to a level of a disagreement. So explore both disagreements and failures as the result of possible friction between cultures. And you need to exhibit the culture of the project. So practice the, uh, you know, as I said, practice builds culture. Management has to lead by example. You can't have executive washrooms. Management can't go off and do things in secret with the exception of you know, things that are obviously legally encumbered to be restricted. Uh, consider cultural differences when you're in discussions, when you're doing planning, when you're writing up use case definitions, when you're doing documentation. The cultural differences will, will play, should factor into all of those. And finally, treat everyone, every objection, every suggestion, and every point of view with respect. Assume that everyone on the project is working towards success, Never attribute to malice what can be explained by ignorance or cultural differences. And in closing, when we're connected to others, we become better people. 
and the art of cross-cultural man team management resolves to this one point, be a better person. Thank you.